Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading is taken from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your stuff and your robe that comfort me. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen.
truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will tell you what is yet to come. Happy Sabbath. You know, I'm going to say it's loud, right? Happy Sabbath. Uh, firstly, I want to take this moment to recognize all our visitors. We always like to say, if you've been with us for five minutes, you're family. Amen? If you've been here for five minutes, you're family. And also, I'll take this opportunity to recognize our members. I'm going to ask you a tough assignment this morning, and it's simply this, if you could pray for me. Amen? I'm not going to ask for 10 or for 5. I'll ask everybody to pray for me. Is that okay? Uh, the message this morning, rather than preach it, I thought, let me just teach. Uh, it's a lesson which was inspired by Seth, believe it or not. We were here last week, and the kids were here reciting and doing what they do best here at Katy Christian Academy. I was sitting behind there, and as I saw these young boys come up and recite the Psalm 23, I sat there asking myself, how many of the Psalms have I recited in my life? I thought about it, and I kept rewinding that Psalm over and over and over and over. So I had to go back to it and see if I could uh, enlighten myself with the gems it has. So I've entitled this, The Lord is My Shepherd. And I also want to thank Seth for the recitation again. It further encouraged me again this morning. Amen? Amen. Life is nothing more than a test. The hardest test that anyone can ever take. There is no studying or knowing the next question. Each question gets harder, but we must pass. We must push to the limits, if even sometimes on faith alone. Amen? Martin Luther had this to say, The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in the moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in the times of challenge and controversy. See, God creates us out of nothing. Until a man recognizes that he is nothing, God can do nothing with him. I came across, again, a very interesting poem this past week, written by James C. Wallace, entitled, What Does God Look Like? 
In the poem, he has this to say, there's an eye that never sleeps beneath the wing of night. There's an ear that never shuts when sink the beams of light. There's an arm that never tires when human strength gives way. There's love that never fails when earthly love decay. The eye unseen overwatcheth all. That arm upholds the sky. The ear doth hear the sparrow's call. That love is never nigh. As I pondered about this, again I was led back to our narrative this morning. And I'll read it again in your hearing. It simply says nothing but this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Father God, again we come to this hour as I stand before your people. It's my prayer, Father, as your people are praying for me, that it's not me who has to speak to them. Yes, they will hear my voice, but Father, I ask that they hear your voice. As I step down, I want you to rise. Speak to your people. We thank you for your graces. We thank you for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sang earlier, Does Jesus Care? A very beautiful song written by Frank Greff. Uh, apparently, we learned that the Greffs had a beautiful daughter. And as a as custom of the day, all the girls and ladies wore you know, all these floor-length dresses. You don't see those anymore. But nonetheless, these were long dresses they wore with many layers of laces and frills. Most homes then were heated by fireplaces or hood-burning stoves. One day, the daughter got too close to the fireplace, however. Unfortunately, the skirt caught on fire. They frantically tried to save her, but the fire consumed her rapidly. Nothing, nothing could be done for her, and she burned to death in the fire right in front of their eyes. Pastor Greff was overcome with grief, as you can imagine. Like all of us, he began to question if Jesus really cared about what had just gone uh, down in his family, how his daughter was caught up in fire and perished. Through these difficult moments, we have these words, does Jesus care? When I have said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me, and my sad heart acts till it nearly breaks, is it ought to him, does he care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for myth or song, as the burdens press and the cares distress and the ways grows weary and long, does Jesus care? As if nothing had happened, it's also recorded that he had very audibly an answer coming, coming out to him saying, oh yes, he cares, I know. He cares. His heart 
is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the nights drearily, I know my Savior cares. Amen? The book of Psalm is a very interesting book. I've often just passed through it. Each time I needed encouragement, I'll basically just brush through it. But I went back again to try to figure out what the book is all about. I know most of you are Bible students. I'm way behind you, but this is what I had to learn. Charles Spajon commenting about the book of Psalms had this to say. The book of Psalms instructs us in the use of wings as well as words. It sets us both mounting and singing. Amen? What I've discovered, the book of Psalms is nothing but the diary of Jesus Christ. Written actually advance a prophecy, most of them, of him becoming a man. Psalms, it is nothing, it's all but Christ. Of all the experience mankind have ever written in the Psalms, if you go back and read it, Christ is supreme. Christ then is the theme of the Psalms. The Psalms means nothing to me now but Christ as God, Christ as man. In the Psalm, we see the mind and the emotions of Jesus Christ. David needs no introduction to most of us. He is the hero of the Old Testament. Psalm 23, particularly my discussion this morning, is ascribed or attributed to him. He wrote many other psalms, most of them, close to, about 73, 73 of them was written by David. Again, David needs no introduction. A son of Jesse, the youngest of eight children, he was a shepherd, a musician, a poet, a giant slayer, a warrior, a rebel, a king, even a murderer, but above all, David loved God. Amen? Amen. Above all, David loved God. A lot of writers, scholars have waited on the psalm, and some, they had this to say, particularly trying to describe Psalm 23. They call it the shepherd psalm. Some call it the shepherd song. Others, the psalm of psalm beauty. Others, the psalm everybody knows. And Martin Luther again weighs in and says, Psalm 23 is a little Bible. Amen? Psalm 23 is nothing but a little Bible. Come with me again to the book of Psalm 23. I'm not going to be reading word for word. I'm going to try to just get most of the uh, uh, gems I was able to find in my study. The geography of Psalm 23 is very spectacular. When you find Psalm 23, is in between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. These are nothing but two mountains. As you get to Psalm 22, you find that you are right there at the Mount of Golgotha. Christ is being crucified on that mountain. And as he comes down, you meet Christ in the valley. Hence, we call it Psalm 23. Christ himself moans to his father, the shepherd, the real shepherd, and cries out what we just read. As you climb up the next mountain, you find yourself in Psalm 24. It's nothing but after he had died, he went to heaven and he was crowned in heaven. It's interesting as you read Psalm 22 as well. It opens up by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most of us, we are particularly familiar with these sayings because that's what he said right on the cross. 
Hence they call it the Psalm of the Golgotha. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groanings, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. If you continue to read it, even to the end, you hear the psalm saying, verse 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will born. He has done this. It's exactly the same word you find in New Testament which says it is finished. Psalm 22 gives you the emotions of Christ hanging on the cross. He did not run away from all his accusers. He stayed because of you and I. He had to hung Nails had to be nailed on his hands. He was pierced. He was mocked just because of you and I. So when I get to the valley, when he comes down from the cross and I get to the valley in Psalm 23, he has been there. He has died. He has been there and the devil had tried to put him down but when you meet him in Psalm 23 he is nothing but a savior hence even David had nothing to say but this the Lord is my shepherd the Lord is my shepherd Psalm 23 again in the valley, it's the psalm of the valley. Some have described it with the green grass, still waters, and the grazing sheep. It gives nothing but hope, comfort, and courage to God's people during our earthly pilgrim. As the children of Israelites were leaving uh, Egypt during their exodus going to Canaan, we just Learned this morning as well, uh, during the 13th Sabbath, they had a beautiful story. And I was saying, hallelujah, the Spirit is here. Again, I want to pause this moment and thank everybody who came before me. God works in miraculous ways. During that exodus movement, we find God himself amongst his people, leading them like a shepherd to the promised land. Christ is our shepherd to our promised land. As he comes down from Psalm 22, from that dangerous biggest mountain ever, the devil thought he had put for him. He conquered hell. He wakes up three days after, and he is alive even today. Through his cross, through this cross, you and I can sit here and say, the Lord is our shepherd. Amen? Very interesting aspect as you continue to read down in this psalm. Some even talked about it as the psalm of resurrection. Describing the son of man as the good shepherd passing through the dark valley. He leads everybody safely through the dark shadows of death. The green pastures, the still waters provides nothing but rest, comfort, mercy, and righteousness. Because of his presence, it's okay and it's possible for you and I to wear these valleys because we know through him we are conquerors. Amen? Through him we are nothing but conquerors. It's an experience for all of us. Psalm 23 is our experience in life. Psalm 23 is our journey as we head towards our heavenly canon. Psalm 23, we find water which refreshes our life. God provides the bread of life. God provides us divine grace from the mountain of hope 
and glory in future. It is the Mount of the Cross, and through this valley of experience to the Mount of Zion, that the shepherd of our soul will lead his flock home. Beloved, you, have, you and I have no reason not to be in heaven. He has provided everything for us. He went before us. He took the experience before us. All we have to do, like obedient sheep, is to do nothing but to follow. I also believe that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And therefore, he is the shepherd of the Psalm 23. He is also the real author of Psalm 23, for he is the word of God. His spirit was all in the prophets, including everybody else who ever prophesies. All good word comes from God. So I do believe that David, as he wrote this, it was Christ himself who gave him the words, pointing to him as he came down to die for you and I. Hence, we can call him the good shepherd. It is very appropriate that David was also the author of this. As you look back to his life, David is nothing but a shepherd. He has lots of stories about slaying lions, about bears, and the most common of all stories, the giant Goliath. David goes before Goliath and challenges him and tells him, today, this very day, I'm going to kill you. Holding, knowing that he could trust God. And as you look at David's life, through his life as he's running away from Saul, David as the second king, Saul is jealous, the spirit has left Saul. He's chasing, finding every opportunity to kill him. And you can sit with David as he writes this psalm as well, that throughout all his experiences, the Lord had led him. Throughout all his circumstances, God was his shepherd. God led him through. God gave him peace. God let him sit by the still waters. God was the shepherd David relied on. Hence, he sings about it in Psalm 23. He rejoices, he jubilates because of this experience. The valley of shadow of death, David, in his own life, experienced that. But at the end of the story, we hear, we know that David was able to prevail, and hence, is often dubbed the greatest king of Israel. See, Palestine, when you take a look at the geography again of Palestine, is a land of sheep and shepherds. Uh, the figure of shepherds leading uh, in the Bible is nothing but a spiritual representation of God leading his church. Hence, we call him God the Good Shepherd. And we are his flock. A faithful shepherd often is called the leader of a city. We have an account and we know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were all shepherds. Joseph himself before Pharaoh testifies to Pharaoh and says, My father and my brethren were shepherds and they know no other occupation. Moses was a shepherd for 40 years. And Moses was appointed by God to lead the Israelites. We know about Amos. The prophet Amos was also a shepherd. David, no introduction, was nothing but a prophet king who was also trained as a shepherd. The provision is, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We read this from Philippians 4.19. Excuse me. 
And one author had this to say, the complete provision for our spiritual needs is set forth in Psalm 23. As a gracious host, it has furnished a table for the poor, has given bread and meat to the hungry, and water to the fainting and thirsty. It has, Psalm 23, rained down manna for the needy, and provided to the people the corn of heaven. It has given rest for the weary, peace to the perplexed, beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It has charmed away our grief, poured balm and consolation into the sick and wounded. It has healed the brokenhearted, set at liberty them that are bruised, preached deliverance to the prisoner and captive, and broken their chains. It has befriended the deserted and forsaken, uh, defended the weak, remembered the forgotten, championed the lonely, restored the disinherited, strengthened the feeble knees, and lifted up the hands which hung down. It has repaired and built up wasted lives and raised up generations long desolate. Like the high priest of the Lord with bejeweled breast, it has maintained to God and men. Amen? Amen. We see in the psalm nothing but everything you and I need. The psalm is something all of us should memorize. I was encouraged again by Seth, and I started memorizing it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's nothing but a message of leadership in providing care. The cross is nothing you and I can ever do without. We need the cross. Amen? We had to have the cross. See, when you go back to Genesis, the devil had a master plan. The devil didn't want you to have eternal life. So the devil took away what belonged to you, stripped away from Adam. But at the cross, Christ takes it back. Amen? At the cross, you and I can go and we are redeemed. He is, as he said to Moses, he is the great I am. He addressed Moses, we remember, on the burning bush. He says to himself, I am who I am. So as you look at this psalm, I'm not going to go through all of it because of time. If I was writing, I ended up with 40 pages on these six verses. Things just keep coming. So I'm not going to cover all of it. I'm going to just try to pick up what I believed helped me in my life. And it's my prayer as well that it will help you as well. So Jesus here is identifies himself nothing. If you forget anything what I have said, in Psalm 23, Jesus Christ identify himself specifically as the shepherd Lord. And as you see him lamenting, he's relying on nothing but his father, Jesus, the Lord himself. To his disciples, Jesus said, Fear not, little folk, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We read that in Luke 12, verse 32. Paul had this to say, referred to Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep, Hebrews 13, verse 20. And Peter called him, the chief shepherd, First Peter 5, verse 4. Again, Jesus himself, I am the good shepherd, and that is in John 10, verse 11. So this psalm in itself stands on its own. It stands on the foot of Christ. It is Christ himself looking to his Father, asking for him to lead him through. To you and I, we look to God, to God Jesus Christ, as we call upon him because he went through the cross to deliver us, to lead us home like the good sheep we should. Hence, Psalm 22, as one of the most 
recited, one of the most known should always be our song. Psalm 23 should always be our, our psalm. It should be our praise because indeed the Lord is our shepherd. Amen? In it, you would find that if I were to summarize it, I would summarize it as this. The Lord is my shepherd is nothing but relationship. I shall not want, says nothing, but that's the supply he would give me. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. It is but nothing rest to me. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's my refreshment. He restores my soul. That's my healing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. He is guiding me for his name's sake because that's his purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that's my test. Um, I will fear no evil. He will protect me. For thou art with me. That's my faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He will discipline me. Thou prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It is my hope. Thy anoint my head with oil. That's my consecration. My cup runneth over. He is full of abundance, and he will provide all the cares of my need. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It is nothing but a blessing, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. He has my security. He has my back forever and forever. If I do his will, I will stay with him in eternity. Amen? just want to read you a couple stories here and I'll close. I have more than 18 pages but I won't go through all of them. Fanny, Co Fanny Crosby is one of the most celebrated musicians of her time. One day Fanny Crosby desperately needed five dollars to help her with all her necessities. As was her custom, Fanny began to pray because he didn't have the money and he had to find something to help her during this pressing need. A few minutes later, a stranger came to her door with exact amount he had been praying, she had been praying for, the $5 bill. Testifying about the incident, she says, I have no way of accounting for this. She also goes on to say, except to believe that God put it in the heart of this good man to bring the money. My first thought was, it is so wonderful the, the way the Lord leads me. All the way is the song she composed after a stranger stopped by to give her the five dollars she has praised for. All the way is an expression of her gratitude to answer prayers. And this is what she says. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask besides? Can I doubt his tendencies? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever before me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me. Cheers, every winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread, though my weary steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see, all the way my Savior leads me. Amen? In closing, 
want to challenge you this morning to go back and read these chapters. Go back in your devotion and read Psalm 23. Read all the Psalms. They'll do good to your soul. So one person had this to ask. So then, who is this God I serve? Who is this King of glory we hear in Psalm? The summary is nothing but this. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the omnipotent King, Rock of Ages, Prince of Peace, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Exalted One, Divine Deliverer, the Provider, the Protector, Ruling Lord, reigning the King of all the universe. He is the author of holiness, the teacher of righteousness, the instigator of justice, and the instructor of goodness. He is the perfection of life, the father of wisdom, the living water, the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the bright morning star, the everlasting Father, the light of men. He is my provider, my sanctification, my ban, my shepherd, my healer, my peace, my righteousness. He is sovereign and sufficient, merciful and mighty, all-powerful and awesome. He is my Father, my helper, guardian and my God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all he keeps. Who is this God? He is the architect of the universe, the manager of all times. He always was, always is, always will be, and never wasn't because he is unmovable, unchangeable, undefeatable, and incorruptible. His character is flawless. His reputation is spotless. His love, boundless. His word, priceless. His faithfulness is matchless. And his kingdom is endless. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought to life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. Again, who is this God I save? The world can't understand him. The armies cannot defeat him. The devil could not tempt him. The wicked can't stand him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The new age will never replace him. The people get enough of him and the world cannot ignore him. Who is this God I serve? The Pharisees could not confuse him. The Sadducees could not trap him. Pilate could not convict in him. Herod could not kill him. The persecution could not scare him. The beatings could not shake him. The grave could not hold him. Death could not master him. The gates of hell can't stand against him. He is my friend, the good-hearted, the defender of widows, a father of the fatherless, an advocate of the persecuted, a guardian of the innocent, a light for the lost, and hope for the hopeless. He is a compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, wonderful in counsel, and magnificent in wisdom. Who is this God I serve? He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. Worthy of the highest praise, the greatest of glory, the ultimate honor. He is robed in majesty, armed with strength, dressed in righteousness, and has a crown of glory like no other. He is light, he is love, and he is Lord. He is goodness. His kindness, his gentleness, and his God. His holy, his righteous, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. He will, his will is unchanging, and his mind is on me. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy, my comfort, my Lord 
and he rules my life. I save him because he is bound in love. His yoke is easy, his burden is light, and his goal for me is nothing but a burden life. When I fall, he lifts me. When I fail, he forgives me. When I'm weak, he's strong. When I'm lost, he's my way. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. When I'm vulnerable, he's my shield. When I'm shaken, he's my rock. When I wonder, he finds me. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I hit, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trial, he is with me. When I face persecution, he protects me. When I face problems, he comforts me. I face when I'm lost, he comforts me. When I face death, he will carry me home. For I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders, the overseer of overcomers, the consuming fire, the sovereign Lord of that all was, is and is to come. He is, he is, he is, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, I wish I could describe him, but I can't. Because there's no words that I can define him. No poems that can illuminate, illuminate him. No roles that can measure him. No canvas that can portray him. No thought that can comprehend him. No mind that can conceive him. No time that can explain him. And no temples that can ever hold him. He's simply everything for me for everybody, everywhere, every time, every time. The Lord is my shepherd.